you got to check this one out. This video is going to be a mic drop video. What's up everyone? Welcome to my very humble channel. Now let's get right on into it. Paul Saladino. Now I've got nothing but mostly respect. <laughs> I know. But uh, he just put out a video with Thomas DeLauer talking about the five reasons. Was it five things Paul Saladino changed, changed his mind on after quitting the carnivore diet? And all he did was say everything, most of the video that I've been saying for years and years and years. And he's a doctor. So every time somebody has a little mental breakdown in my comment section going, you're not a doctor, then I will point them towards Paul Saladino and this video. Well, this is very interesting. We have Paul and you have Thomas DeLauer. And again, both of, both of them are sort of softballing each other. It's not a debate, rather a just an interview. But when they got on the subject of, of uh, fasting, oh, Thomas DeLauer started backpedaling a little bit. But I do commend Paul for kind of keeping it real in this video. So let's pull it up and see what Paul and Paul Saladino are saying that confirms everything I've been saying for years. That I've changed my mind on since I wrote the book in 2019 was carbohydrates and then in connecting with that, the ketosis and ketogenic diets. So when I wrote The Carnivore Code, and this is humbling, this is what we all do is we write books and then you put your thoughts into cement, you freeze your thoughts in kryptonite and then you change your thoughts and you think, oh, the book, it's just not a living document. So. But when I wrote the book, I was of the opinion that carbohydrates were not great for humans and was sort of looking at the literature differently. And over time, I learned personally in my own life, doing a carnivore diet of meat, organs, and fat and salt for a year and a half, that including carbohydrates in my diet improved my health from there. So my whole- Okay, do you guys notice he said for me personally, thank you, Paul, for stating that, that he is including himself. Will he tell his audience, I'm sorry you guys were following my book, my carnivore code, and that it could have hurt you? He's not saying that, which I understand that would be a huge thing. I would say it in two seconds because that doesn't bother me to see myself evolve over time and say, like, you don't don't waste your money on MCT oil. But I guess that's a smaller thing than writing a whole book that you're not following anymore. But let's keep going. The story is that... I was eating kind of a paleo diet, had really bad eczema, which I'd had my whole life. Getting rid of vegetables and all plant food significantly improved the eczema, so much so that in the last four and a half, five years since I've been on this more specific path, I haven't had any flares of the eczema that are significant at all. That was a okay, so he says he has not had the flares that are, that are significant. That means he's still having them, my people. People, there's a lot of people who are still reacting to fruit. And remember, fruit goes to the liver and then turns into triglycerides within the cells if you don't use that energy far more easily than sugar. But I digress because it goes to the liver first and it's it burdens the liver if you're eating a lot of fruit, which he is. Now, also, somebody said I made, you know, I said uh, he's looking a little like he's getting too much sun, but I don't think this is sun that we see on Paul's face. This is looking a little bit like oxidative damage. This isn't just sun, my people, because he's Italian. It's a big deal because I had massive eczema on my elbows, my wrists, my hips, so much so that I really couldn't even wear pants easily. It would get on my shirts. I couldn't do jujitsu because I had uh, eczema on my knees and it was getting infected. So getting rid of vegetables really helped with my eczema. And then I learned after a year and a half that I was getting such bad muscle cramps, heart palpitations, sleep disturbances, my testosterone. He's gonna talk about testosterone. I mentioned this. 
if you're doing a carnivore diet, you're going to jack up your electrolytes, especially if you're fasting and doing carnivore and doing one meal a day. And he's literally singing the song that I've been praising for years. Be careful on carnivore. And people quibble and cry about, oh my God, you're always saying what's negative. I've always said that carnivore is good for the short term. But as you can see with Paul, for the long term, it started damaging his body. It was kind of going down. Right now, it's around seven or 800. I've, been on, I've included carbohydrates in my diet for the last two and a half years. But at that point, it was going 450, 500, significantly lower. And my sex hormone binding globulin was creeping up. So I had electrolyte issues. And what I realized was that I'd been thinking about insulin wrong. I'd been thinking that I needed to keep my insulin low all of the time. And to be now. He's talking about insulin low, that this is a misnomer because people are, are not walking around with super low insulin by the droves who are doing a carnivore diet. Some people experience physiological insulin resistance. Or some people eat too much protein, which means they still are secreting bolus amounts of insulin. So this part of his science, eh, some people, not all. To be fair, on a carnivore diet, my fasting insulin was low, 3.5, 3.0. And I thought, incorrectly that if I ate carbohydrates, my insulin would spike and that would be a bad thing, right? What I realized, and I wasn't taught this in medical school, was that insulin spike. Oh, he just debunked um, Dr. Fung. I almost called him fungus. <laughs> Dr. Fung. He has debunked him because Dr. Fung is always talking about fasting and insulin low. So why are they two doctors contradicting each other? For those who ask me what my education is, just saying. After you eat carbohydrates are actually healthy for the human body for a variety of reasons. So insulin is probably something else I've changed my mind on, carbohydrates and insulin. What I realize now is that your body needs an insulin signal after a meal when you eat carbohydrates to signal to the kidneys to resorb and hold on to minerals. So this is true, but listen to me now, my people. Your body, and I've, the reason why I don't think he knows this is because I work with people with glucometers. Years and years and years. And people are having glucose spikes within the first 30, one hour, and then the, glu the insulin and the glucose starts going down into this after the second hour. Everybody has a glucose spike from eating meat and fat or fat and meat within that first hour. That is normal. So what is he talking about? sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So the massive profound electrolyte problems that people get on long-term ketogenic diets are almost certainly due to a lack of insulin signaling at the level of the kidney. There are various levels of kidney physiology upon which insulin is going to act, but people in the ketogenic space, I think are well-intentioned that they're trying to hold on to minerals by including massive amounts of salt in their diet, but it just doesn't work because you need. Okay, remember he's saying that on a ketogenic or carnivore diet, you don't have enough insulin signaling to hold on to minerals. This is not true. Clearly, I am holding on to minerals. Now I have to mind my minerals, right? I have to take my magnesium, eat an avocado, drink enough water and not overdo the salt. And then I'm fine. But if I don't do those things, those actions, then I have problems. Need an insulin signal at the level of the kidney to hold on to those things. So the first thing I did when I sort of transitioned off a ketogenic zero carb quote unquote carnivore diet was include honey in my diet. And the first couple of days I felt a little weird because I was physiologically insulin resistant. And then your body kind of adjusts to this, my blood sugar spikes normalize. And you know, if I eat honey today or a few years ago after I had adjusted to having the carbohydrates back in my diet, my blood sugar might go 130, 140, 150 milligrams per deciliter. But I don't 130, oh my God, no, 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 no. Let's talk about this. Are you freaking kidding me? 130, 140, 150, or 160 is dangerous. If your blood sugar is shooting that high because you had some fruit, then you have issues regulating. You are dysglycemic. You are not regulating your blood sugar. Hmm, maybe all that fruit, not enough fat. He's not eating carbs. I don't believe he's eating starches. Maybe he is. I don't know. But if you're including honey and your blood sugar shoots up that high on honey and he's that active, his blood sugar maybe should hit 105, not 150, 160. That is bolus amounts of insulin being secreted. And he mumbles it. Like he says that whole thing really, really fast. 
Watch the replay. What? No. That's not safe. If your blood sugar is shooting that high, you might be insulin resistant. You might be dysglycemic. You might be hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. And then you're going to just literally have all of the cortisol issues, the sleep issues, the electrolyte issues on blood sugar that high. And you're going to be storing tons of fat. Tons. You ain't going to lose weight with 150, 160 milligrams per deciliter. Mm -mm. Not unless you're super metabolically strong. And he's got a lean muscle, a lot of lean muscle. And he's very active. Not that many people are, are going to be as active as Paul is, especially, I think he's at 46 or 48. Mm -hmm. Context, people. Not everyone's the same. I don't worry about that because if you look at the actual uh, the actual shape of that curve, it comes back down to a baseline very quickly within the hour for sure. So this is normal human physiology and we should not fear glucose spikes. You should not have your blood sugar shoot up to 150, 160 within an hour. That is way too high on honey. You should see 105, maybe 110, but not 150, 160. There's something wrong with his uh, glucose control in a metabolically healthy individual. It's going to go up, it's going to come back down. That's normal and that insulin signaling is healthy. And he didn't say down to what number? I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. For humans, at so many levels, it's healthy for our hormones, it's healthy for our brains, it's healthy for the production of glutathione and the resorption of minerals. So that idea of insulin being all bad, all the time. Not 150 milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar. Mm -mm time and including carbohydrates in my diet, that was a huge, huge thing. And now we know, I mean, there's tons of research that I just didn't see at that point that I was sort of blind to about carbohydrates for athletes, carbohydrates post-exercise. I mean, we just worked out. I have holes in my shorts now from the, uh, the weight belt. And this, you know, this, this weight that I was using has ripped a hole in the front of my shorts here. And carbohydrates post-exercise are so clearly shown to improve performance. Carbohydrates overall are shown to improve all sorts of metrics in humans, testosterone, recovery, sleep, all kinds of things. So those are two what, big what, ones wait, for me from the- What squats were you doing there? I gotta look at that again later. Either I saw something wrong or those squats look challenging in, in, in his form way. Hmm. That's it. Now, on the cramping side, I've got a question. As far as, uh, because I've experienced that on, when I'm where I'm low carb, right? Mm -hmm. I'm very, very prone to cramping, which as someone that does a lot of endurance stuff, it's problematic. Like if I'm back country or anything like that. Okay. Uh, Somebody who eats carbs are prone to cramping? No, I was a pro skater. We used to ski skate five or six hours a day, sweating our, our nullicks off. And I never, ever had cramping, ever. And I was just doing a long trek and, and ran into a huge cramping issue, even though I'm not super low carb anymore. I guess I'd still low-ish carb. And I would argue that it actually takes time. Wait, you've done 5,000 keto videos and now you're not doing it anymore? And you you guys were calling me nutso. Well, Thomas DeLauer said, oh my goodness. I'm not trying to make fun of him. It's just so frustrating that they push, push, push. You guys bought their concept. Now they've changed their tune. How many tunes are they gonna change? I've stuck with keto the whole time, but all my videos are to warn you on to how to do it, what your existing health is, what's going on with your electrolytes, the stress in your life, right? Because we don't want our bodies to be, de be depleted of sodium when you're trying to balance your electrolytes when you're stressed out or not sleeping. Every little thing matters. I'm to actually like recover from some of that uh insulin issue that you have with the kidneys. But the question that I've always had, and maybe you know the answer, since protein is insulinogenic, can you get some resorption of the minerals to the insulin? Oh, did you hear them say protein is insulinogenic? All right. Like with protein, or does the glucagon cancel that out in that case? I mean, you get some, it's just nowhere near. If you yeah. look at the amount of insulin. So what he's saying is insulinogenic, secreting a lot of insulin, which means you secrete a lot of insulin when you have your blood sugar get too high on too much protein. Y'all stop eating all that protein. None of these carnivore doctors say the same thing now. They're all changing their tune.
now we've got the fruit and carbs. These aren't even carnivore people anymore now. But you wrote a book called The Carnivore Code. And I'm not trying to trash Paul because this video, I'm really proud of him for making this video and being more transparent. I mean, I guess he's fully transparent in his own um, perception. But uh, it seems like he's really saying all the things that really fracked him up. And I applaud him for that. But I can still sort of poke at how I still think that in two years from now, he'll be changing again. Insulin and the level of insulin you get with carbohydrates, it's much, it's much higher than it is, which is protein. I mean, you get some with protein, it's just not the same as a carbohydrate spike. And so people in communities that are fearful of carbohydrates will say, look at how much insulin you're getting. And that's, that's good. You know, yeah. you need that. And so, so people understand this also, like when you don't eat carbohydrates, you become insulin resistant. This is not the pathological insulin resistance of diabetes, which is different physiology that I can describe. He's talking about physiological insulin resistance where your blood sugar starts to go higher and higher. Then why has that not happened to me? You can't use things like pathological insulin resistance, or he said not pathological for everyone. This might've been your case, boo-boo, but this is not my case. And I'm very active too. I work out six days a week and I mind a whole farm slash ranch by myself. Describe. This is the insulin resistance of physiology. Basically, historically, evolutionarily, this is starvation insulin resistance, meaning that you are physiologically insulin resistant. Your body is saying, hey, spare the glucose, any glucose you're getting, spare that for the brain, the adrenals, and the gonads. So basically what he's saying, because he's not talking about ketosis, he's like, oh, you guys, you're not getting enough blood sugar. So the body's like, spare it. So your body starts to like crank out more insulin, blood sugar starts to spike, gl gluconeogenesis, and you're in a chronic state of breaking down, eating your own muscle to feed the brain and blood sugar starts spiking. Yes, if you eat too much protein. Yes, if you have too much cortisol and stress in your life, but not if you're ketotic, obviously, or I'd look like dog poop at this juncture ads and maybe the red blood cells, don't put it in the muscles. That's physiologic insulin resistance. And that's what you see in people who are low carb or zero carb or keto. And that's why the first time someone like that eats carbohydrates, they may feel very strange or the blood sugar. Okay. I've had people do keto for years, go off of keto. They don't feel strange, right? This happens with dysglycemic people. I am not having any issues with muscle growth. I'm not, I'm not um, preventing. I don't have any chronic fatigue. I don't have any, I do have stress, um, but it's just, it's a healthy stress from working on my ranch. And uh, yeah, I feel like I've worked out my own keto adaptation to the point where I'm humming. Most people don't get there. He didn't get there, but let's listen. You're gonna go up. This is why a woman who is low carb will fail a glucola test in her pregnancy because that is physiologic insulin resistance. And that's, I actually have. Okay, can you talk about ketones in this whole thing? Because if you're not ketotic, then he could perhaps be right, right? Blood sugar swings, gluconeogenesis, cortisol pathway, because you're not adapted. But he's not talking about that. Hmm. Come to believe that's not a good thing. I don't think we want to be physiologically insulin resistant. It is a wow. historically evolutionarily adaptive thing for extreme situations, but I think that humans do better. And I've come to see carbohydrates as a signal of abundance. I mean, if you go to see, spend time with the Hadza or the Maasai or the Samburu or uh, the Khoisan, I mean, these tribes invariably seek carbohydrates and they celebrate it. They don't it's the baboon skin. The baboon skin gives me the strength. I thought we were making the fire to cook, but it turns out we we're making the fire to bake. For me, what would you do if a man wearing a baboon skin hat? Do you see they have shorts on? Now I went to Tanzania and I was around the Maasai. Yes, I went to Tanzania years ago and I went on a safari and we stopped and I met several Maasai. Look at those shorts. They're all ruined by the West. That offers you a newspaper joint in the middle of the African bush. Would you say yes or would you say no? Let me know in the comments.
I asked why, when, how, all of the questions. It simply said that it's part of their culture. I don't know for how. Not the shorts, not the newspaper. Our world is changing, but that's the hot stuff. You guys want to see what the hot stuff looks like? Cause I, I know, and I've been to Tanzania. So I, I don't know if I've met the Hatsa. I was in Tanzania when I'm in my 20s. I'm in my 50s now. And I went on a four or five day safari where you camp out in the Serengeti up in Nguru Nguru. Carbs today already. I'm not going to eat this. They, when I was with the Hadza, we found a beehive and they just went, they just went off on this thing. I mean, they were giving, I got a big chunk of beehive and ate it with the larva in there and the the honey and it's amazing. And the other the three Hadza guys that I was with were probably ate 60, 70% of the, the honey in this hive and then shared a little bit with their comrades when they came back. So, hey, we okay, let me tell you right now when you're a hunter gatherer, right? You're only eating honey in season. You have to climb up a tree with no suit on and you got to climb high and throw the honeycombs down to the person below. And you're going to share it in a tribe between 15 and 20 people. Yes, of course, that's natural in nature. Absolutely. Being ketotic 24 hours a day, year after year after year is not natural. Is he trying to say that this is a, a honey should be the staple that everybody goes because that's their go to food? No, this is something they're going to have that's a treat only a certain time of the year, not all year, not at your sprouts and at your whole foods. Let's continue. We found a hive. Here's a small amount for you guys, but they'd eaten a ton of this stuff. So historically, I think humans had massive exposure to carbohydrates whenever they could get it, as much as they could get it. Yeah. They yeah. didn't fear it. At He's wrong. Like I just said, one beehive is not going to produce a lot of honey for a bunch of people. You would get spoons of it and have to share it with everyone. So make it make sense. At all. I would agree. I mean, I definitely feel like, you know, to say that carbohydrates aren't evolutionarily correct is, uh, is invalid. I, I mean, it's, I think there's carbohydrates are evolutionarily correct. What are you talking about? What are you, are you talking about bread? You're talking about crackers. You're talking about honey, which is hard to get. You're talking about the fruit that's been genetically modified, hybridized, selectively bred. The fruit today is not what you would find in nature at all. Hmm. Context is important. There's, there's always access to them at some at some point, one well, way or another. So, and I, humans are seeking them. Yeah, yeah. If we don't have them, we're seeking them. If if we can't find if we can't find them in berries, I didn't mean to cut you off, but if we can't find them in berries, if we can't find them in honey, we're going to find them in roots. Yeah. Like we, it's like it's a piece. Just like I mean, it's interesting. It's it's just so intuitive and simple. It is a piece, but they were seeking meat first, not carbohydrates. Oh. We're looking for animal protein. We're looking for nutrients and organs. That's clear. We're always eating the whole animal. But the next thing, I think in tandem with that, we're also seeking carbohydrates as wild humans. We've forgotten what wild humans look like because we all, except for maybe a couple thousand people on the planet today, live as semi-domesticated humans. Um, but it's very clear. I mean, if you look at the Hadza, so there was a PhD researcher who actually spent a lot of time with them and gave them surveys of these nomadic tribes and said, what are your favorite foods? And there were five foods that were their favorite. So there was there, were, there was meat, there were berries, there was baobab, there was tubers, and I forget the last one, I'll think of it in a moment. But honey was invariably the first thing that they wanted. Both men and women ranked honey as number one. Remember, you can't get honey very often when you're living outside in a tribe. He is a person who's a Western person who goes to the supermarket to get his honey. I would love it if Paul got all of his honey from a honeybee tree with no suit on, no freaking you know, ropes or anything to secure him while trying to get honey. Of course, they're going to love it. It's so hard to get. Context is everything. One. And Mem said meat as number two. Women ranked berries, uh, baobab, and tubers, I think all about the same. But in both groups, the, the roots were sort of the last thing that they wanted to eat. Man, that's wild. But both of them, really, that was the favorite thing for them was honey. Well, I mean, it makes sense. It's delicious. They celebrated it more than anything, right? And if you look at these people, there are tons of studies of them, of their cardiovascular health. They're not. They have insulin sensitivity, which is amazing, which is exemplary. They're not insulin resistant. They're not diabetic. They're not insulin resistant because they're hunter gatherers living outside. It's not because they eat honey. And that's where you got to be very careful. Somebody who is addicted to carbs and processed food might think all they have to do is eat meat and honey. Because Paul said it's 
They're, you're not going to be insulin resistant, but we are not hunter gatherers. We have destroyed gut wall. We have leaky gut. We're, we have heavy metals everywhere. We've got forever chemicals everywhere and they make our bodies misfire. We wear rubber soles. We don't connect to the soil. We don't get the electrons from the soil. We don't follow circadian rhythm. We have Wi-Fi up our brain. We have our Bluetooth in our ear. You can't compare us to them. Not a direct line. But I'm not obese. So I mean, my, I mean, I'll, I'll, my own anecdotal experience, I don't eat an abundance of carbohydrates, but I've added honey and fruit in and my insulin sensitivity has improved on my lab work. So, I mean, it's my nonsense. You're such a, oh my God. You can say anything and the masses will listen because that's the society that we have evolved in. Don't think. Just listen to someone else without using your own thinking. It doesn't matter if it's me or anyone. You can't just take what we say and run with it. I don't believe him. Sorry. I don't believe anything. I don't believe anything. Look at his eyes. Ooh, something, something about that eye. I can't blow it up. Oh, darn it. Something about his eyes is making me not believe him. By yeah. fasting insulin, yeah. which is yeah. perhaps the most clear. Metric you could ever. For you. That's so, I mean, unquestionably an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Yeah. All right. So we've got one and two. What would you say the third thing that you've. Uh... Fasting probably. Yeah. Which is linked. So. The, the literature around fasting and around sort of autophagy is, is not as clear as I once thought it was. It's, it's kind of murky. And I'm just not convinced, number one, that you need to fast to have. Yay, finally. Somebody who has a name and a lot of followers is saying the thing I've been saying for freaking 10 years. Do not fast. Autophagy, if you look at markers of autophagy, our body is always kind of doing this. Our body is always using ubiquitinization of proteins and recycling them. And there's some evidence that you're doing just as much autophagy when you're eating. There's some evidence that's not enough. Thing is when, when you're not. And there are some things that trigger autophagy or autophagy signals that you're eating like glucose or trehalose, which is a sugar that occurs in plant foods. Like that oppose, apparently triggers autophagy. That's including something in your diet. So eating glucose, he said, apparently that triggers autophagy. Now we're saying the same thing, but I just want to listen to the wording. Apparently, these people don't know anything. They're learning just like you all out there and just like me. This triggers autophagy. This is not the traditional, yeah. you know, canonical narrative we hear. So to, to make it this simple narrative, like you must fast to do house cleaning, that sounds very appealing to people. And they're thinking, yes, I just have to fast more and more. I want a clean house. I go home into my house. I'm reading like Marie Kondo. I have to put everything in its place. I want a very clean house. You know, Marie Kondo, like the, yeah, uh, yeah. the, the you know, the life-changing magic of tidying up. So that's what they think about their body when they're fasting. And it's just not that way at all. And there's some evidence that potentially fasting could induce negative cardiac remodeling or lead to fatty infiltration in cardiac tissue. So it's just, fasting is not as benign. He said it could. He doesn't know, but his intuition right now is correct. Fasting creates a lot of issues, and I have 20 videos explaining how, based on my experience with clients. I as people believe it to be, in my opinion, and people get super freaking triggered when we're talking about this, so I know the comments are going to be out of control. But I just, I don't fast anymore, and I, I don't think that, um, that it should be taken as a completely benign intervention. I mean, it was all the rage four or five years ago, and I used to do... I it's the rage now, boo-boo, where you been? And Thomas Delauer is going to come in and say some nonsense. I was doing carnivore. I was doing intermittent fasting. And I just think that's, that's not how I think about it today. I think that there's benefit to giving your body signals of abundance. And we can talk about cancer more if you want or wherever. But I think that there's interesting evidence that sometimes doing too much autophagy is almost leading you toward cancerous pathways. And yeah, this I mean, it's too much of a, I mean, it's. Because fasting puts you down the cortisol pathway. You're not keto adapted. Your electrolytes are tanking. Food is energy. It's not entertainment. It's not the devil. And food also fixes the car. So when you're not giving yourself the nutrition, then it puts pressure on the immune system. And he's about to say something. And I got nothing against 
uh, Tom Stelauer. He's another human being who seems quite lovely, but I just feel like there's so many things. Look at his facial expression. I just don't trust the dude. Sorry. It's a constant give and take. I like the way that, that Mark Sisson actually put it. He was like, I don't even like the word fasting. He's like, I like fractal eating. He's like, I go through periods where sometimes I don't eat, but it's not like I'm consciously thinking about it. And I've come to think that like the body should be flexible enough to handle periods of time without food, but it doesn't need to be this deliberate thing all the time. The time, the body should periods without eating, but not all the time. Look, when you're dealing with dysglycemia, people who've got health issues, uh, it, this fractal eating does not work for most people. Lord have mercy, child. You know, it's it's uh, like, like Mark Sisson. It was interesting. He's just like, yeah, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like eating lunch. You know, it's fine. I don't I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. But I feel like I have a level of adaptation that allows me to do that. A level of what ad adaptation to what? To not eating? People with hypoglycemia can't do that. They'll drink coffee. They'll go down the cortisol pathway when they're not eating any food and wonder why their, their hair is falling out. And they never connect the dots. These men who are very fit need to consider the average person. And it made a lot of sense with me. And, you know, personally, I still, the reasons that I will still train fast in the morning is I feel good fast in the morning, but I also work out first thing in the morning and it also just feels like you know, Paul just was going like, I don't think it's good at all anymore. He like, literally, it's not good at all. And here's Thomas sort of trying to save his business, but he has to continue promoting this nonsense. So look at him trying to totally sidestep keeping the conversation in without stepping on Paul, even though Paul is probably leaning on being correct. Well, I think he's correct a thousand percent, but let's continue. It's weird sometimes, but to your point, if I'm going to eat something when I work out, it's going to be something like watermelon or honey or something that's just like quick absorbing. Really. Watermelon or honey that's quick absorbing. For what, dude? You're not gonna get glycogen storage off of water and honey. You're gonna zing up in 10 minutes and crash. What are you talking about? Quick. Um, so yeah, I've sort of come, I would say full circle and accepting that fasting is not the end all be all by any means. But I do think that for some people. It's not the end all be all, but I'm still making money off of it. So I gotta still like say it's kind of okay as I'm talking to Paul, because it looks like in this conversation that Thomas DeLauer is a little bit infatuated with Paul because Paul is so smart, but like didn't have any common sense when he did this carnivore code clearly because he had issues, which is fine because we all push one thing and start evolving. But it looks like he's a little bit, um, yeah, nosing, the bee nosing. It's psychologically just how it works for them. Like if they can put themselves in a box and not eat during that period of time, um, if that's what works for them, and that's what worked for me when I lost a lot of weight. And uh, I recently did a video kind of talking like why I don't fast so much anymore myself. And I was just thinking, okay, I'm down at the body fat percentage I want to be at. Is it? What are you freaking talking about, PED? Sorry, I shouldn't act this way. I should have more restraint. I just feel like he's so not honest. It's a feeling. I don't need to, because I'm at the body fat. Per Why do you have to have it? That's not natural in nature to have low body fat. It's dangerous, bro. People are following you by the millions. Uh, uh, uh. Mm -mm. I think Paul is a little bit more honest because he's telling you what happened that with that fracked him up. Thomas is not. He's not honest. Is it anal retentive for me to say like, okay, I need to fast X amount of time? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, ah. right. So it's, but I also enjoy how I feel certain times. So I just don't keep a logbook of when I fast anymore. It's just like, it's just going to happen when it happens. I've, I've recently learned about some metrics on the blood work that I think can be very revealing for people. And I think there's a lot of research on this cortisol to DHES ratio. And it's a, it's not a fasted cortisol to DHES. It can be like multiple times a day. You can look at it. But there's pretty good evidence that that ratio can tell us, it's, it correlates very strongly with longevity and morbidity. And so this is really powerful. So I think that if people are curious about this, like we, I think that one of the problems with Western medicine is it's kind of like 35 years of an anachronism. Like we're just thinking about things like the literature suggested 35 years ago. We're not really up to date. And Western medicine, I think of it as like the Titanic. It moves very slowly. But I think everyone when they go to the doctor should be getting a fasting insulin and we should all be getting cortisol to DHES every single time you go to the doctor, probably fasted and in the afternoon. Hell yes. Very, very true.
and comparing those and sort of tracking those. So the, the one metric that I started tracking a few years ago is fasting insulin, and that's been really valuable just to be like, you know, I'm on carnivore, strict carnivore, just meat and organs, my fasting insulin is low. I add carbohydrates, my fasting insulin is low. I add more carbohydrates to 200 or 300 grams a day from fruit and honey, you know, something that a lot of people would say is pure sugar, quote unquote. And again, my fasting insulin remains low, sometimes lower than it was on carnivore. So I think we should- But you also work your ass off, bro. You're a freaking athlete. You're doing hard workouts and you, you, you have nothing to do with a woman's body, especially a woman in her 50s or 40s or even 30s. But yes, he's correct. I'll also be looking at cortisol to DHES ratio and, and just using this as a metric if, if we trust or we believe that the science is robust. And I think it's pretty solid with this ratio and saying, hey, I'm going to go do some workouts faster this week. I'm going to get a cortisol to DHES ratio. Or if you're keto and you really believe it, get a cortisol. He just debunked Thomas. He goes, you can feel like fasting, but taking a test and looking at your fasting insulin and checking your blood sugar. Yo, that's what I've been saying for years for years. All the DHES, DHEAS ratio, and then add carbohydrates. That's uh, cortisol and DHEAS. So DHEA is a precursor to reproductive hormones. So we're looking at what cortisol is doing to your hormones, essentially, by doing that ratio. And see how it changes. Because on one side is the cortisol, right? This is a stress hormone. And I think that there's a lot of validity to thinking about cortisol as an aging hormone. There are actually papers published review papers asking the question, is cortisol an aging hormone? And I think the literature there and the evidence is pretty robust that it is. And you don't want your cortisol to be chronically, tonically high in general. And I think if you look at people on keto, they're going to have higher levels of cortisol. Nonsense. I think again, I'm doing keto for years. My cortisol is not elevated. If, it, if, my, cortisol, if my cortisol was elevated, I would not live this life. It would be too hard. I'd have chronic fatigue, thyroid issues. My hair would fall out. I wouldn't be able to build any muscle. I would be overweight. I'd be estrogen dominant. Be very careful when you generalize, Paul. I mean, there is this moment in the morning when you get this cortisol awakening response. And yes, that is a physiologic diurnal thing that happens. But other than that, you do not want your cortisol to be high. And I think what we see in humans is between meals, if you're fasting, your cortisol starts creeping up. And that's to me is a signal. Maybe it's time to, if you have access to them, eat some carbohydrates to keep it down. I love how he's doubling down on Thomas DeLauer, but you don't have to eat carbohydrates. In fact, eating a fatty meat is the best solution for those who are dysglycemic, which is he just, this is what he's describing with your blood sugar creeping up too high. If you're doing a ketogenic diet or even a carnivore diet or even a low carb high fat diet, it's not to go eat honey or fruit. No, it's to eat a fatty meat in between meals, right? If you're going to do something that has any carbohydrates in it, do something that has fiber in it, let's say like a red potato or a sweet potato in a very small amount. Because if you do uh, fructose or if you do fructose or if you do honey, which is pretty much fructose, your blood sugar is going to skyrocket like his at 150, 160. And then what goes up crashes. And if you're not an athlete, you're not going to balance your insulin to, to glucagon ratio at all down. We live in a stressful world. Driving, you get traffic, you know, you have family things. Why are we putting more stress into our bodies? Mm -hmm. I think that at some level, it's very hard to make an argument for any hormetic. The whole idea of hormesis, I think, is philosophically flawed in many ways, but mm -hmm. it's really hard to make a, a philosophical argument around the benefits of cortisol for hormesis in humans. I mean, it's clearly... There are such strong arguments now that it's aging, that it's pro-diabetic, that it's pro-liver fat. You want to keep this down. And I think that it's very cut and dry just to get cortisol, the DHEA. I am so vindicated with this whole concept of fasting. He's saying every freaking thing. And in his intelligence, he's saying it. Doesn't mean he had common, common sense all the time, but he's a very, very bright person. This is great. And do interventions in your life and see what changes it. And you want to minimize that. You know, you want that ratio to be as low as possible, less than 0.3 perhaps because you want your androgens, this DHEAS is a androgen precursor in the human body. You want your sort of sex hormones for both men and women, these androgens for both men and women to be high, and you want your cortisol to be low, and that's pretty cut and dry. It's like black yeah, and white. No, this that is does, that does something make a, to watch, yeah. Makes a lot of sense, and that's something that anyone can go get an easy test on. That's a pretty inexpensive test, too, if you were to just go a la carte, too. As Brown, Naza. Now you're agreeing with him. Dude, Thomas, I got nothing against him. I think he's a quite lovely person. But he's, he's, a, he's a business, he's a corporation. Like he makes money and 
Paul is doubling down. He is not changing. And Paul's going by his own experience of how things went wrong. And that's when he's starting to be more transparent. So I love this, Paul. Keep it going. This is fast and yeah. insulin, $25, yeah. $30 cash. I want to start like a, a nonprofit and just make fasting insulin free for people or make it accessible because I think it would change the landscape. I, I do agree on that. Definitely agree on that. Yeah. All right. So we got three now. All right. What's, what's number four? <laughs> He's pushing me. So we got carbohydrates, insulin, fasting. I think I would probably say grounding, which Ooh, is a little bit different. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I used to kind of think grounding was woo and didn't really give much thought to it. And now I think about it every day. And, I and that's another thing. Hurrah. But this has nothing to do why he quit with why he quit carnivore. Uh, the grounding thing is something I absolutely agree with. It works. It works. That means get your feet in the soil. My people follow circadian rhythm, get dirty outside. Yes. And I'm back. Okay. Um, yeah, this was a very, very interesting video. They go on and on more about grounding in the rest of the video. But like I said, all of them have nuggets. I even think that Thomas DeLauer has some nuggets of information, but I believe he's a corporation. He works with a company. They come with the content together. It's not like he does it on his own. Paul's sort of going that direction. But the thing about love about Paul is that he's still, he's so intelligent that once he figured it out, I think that if Paul didn't start with pushing the carnivore code and the carnivore diet so hard, then he may have not gone through, gone through, he wouldn't have gone through those pitfalls. And then all the people that were following his dietary measures wouldn't have as well. But the good news is, is that he is now being transparent about everything that he suffered from. And I love that about what he did. Thomas is still going to push his business in my belief. That's not mean or harsh. It's just reality. So there's been a few people in my comment section. They get super triggered when I do these videos. They're not call out videos, but you guys got to understand who've never found me before. Uh, I get all these people in my consultation after consultation after consultation after I have a private group. All of these things, people are like, I followed this person and now my hair's falling out. Follow this person. Now my histamine and now my tongue is... Uh, white coated or now I'm having this pains and symptoms in my spine or my joints or my muscles from oxalate dumping or or um now I have this and now I have that and I have all I have these keto flu symptoms and chronic fatigue and there are so many things that go left where now I can't eat vegetables anymore from following gurus. So at some point I, I kept my mouth closed and I kept my mouth closed and I'd mentioned little things here and there. But now I'm done. I'm done. I'm not coming for anyone. I'm not coming for, for Thomas. Thomas puts out, just like Dr. Berg, he'll put out some informational videos about the body that are great. But when you start talk, talking about keto, fasting, or carnivore, I'm gone. Sorry. I ain't with it. The rest of his stuff has some good little nuggets in there, but the rest, hell, to the not. But thank you, everyone, for checking out this video. I'm just trying to show you guys that fasting is absolutely god awful for the body why would you be in a constant state of cortisol without anything to counteract it so paul's workouts are very cortisol driven your cortisol is going to spike but he's also into grounding now right the fruit thing no i'm never going to agree to that nonsense genetic genetically modified fruit you think those huts are eating that they're not they're eating some tubers or or might pick some berry or some figs right when they're about to drop but no, they're not going and eating honey every day and going to Whole Foods and Sprouts and all this nonsense to get their honey. So we have to be very, very careful when we listen to a guru's change in dietary measures and don't just follow it because now I'm getting people eating fruit and it's not helping. It's not. They feel good in the beginning, but then they start tanking again or their histamine starts getting louder or their dysglycemia gets louder because they're not, Paul. They don't have good glute 4 receptor development. They can't clear out that sugar. They can't burn off that fat. They are not estrogen dominant. And maybe I think that Thomas DeLauer is on PEDs. That's just my opinion. Not going to change it. Could I be wrong? Possible. Do I, do I think I'm wrong? Hell no. Nah. Paul's full natty. Natty means natural. He looks natural. He looks natural. This is a natural athlete of a man in his 40s. Good job, Paul. But I do think that uh, the sugar is creating a little bit of uh, that blood sugar at 150 after an hour. 150, 160 looks a little bit like glycation, a little bit in the face.
just a little bit because he's all of complected my people okay he's all of complected he's just a few shades i'm really dark right now but he's just a few shades louder than me that makes no sense why the, people are like oh he's in the sun so it's rapid aging on his face no i'm in the sun i am baking in the sun with the horses I think something else is going on but that's my guess and i could be wrong but i just want to end this video with Bravo, Paul. I think you put out really great information in this video. You did not softball it like you did on the other one with Chafee. You you nailed it. You hit it out of the park with, with a lot of great knowledge that I think can help people. And I, I just think that everyone should know that I support a lot of the things he said on the diet, except for the fruit and the honey nonsense. But he didn't even like really push that that hard, just a little. If you guys want to learn more, go to stephanieperson.com, book a consultation. I got you back. I've been doing this for a very long time, and I pay attention to the little small details that are important for the individual. And I'm not going to reference myself when helping anybody. A uh, hail to the nod. Uh, also, you can follow me on Instagram at Stephanie Ketogenic, my Facebook fan page at Stephanie the Business Person. And uh, I'm trying my hardest. I really am trying to get this challenge done. So you guys can sign up very soon. But now I got to go and fix fencing. Maybe I'll throw that in the video as well. Yes, my horses got into acorns and it was making them sick to the point where I had to take them to the vet because they stopped eating. They look like bloated blowfish. Even horses can't deal with the phytic acid in friggin' nuts or seeds. Go check out the acorns. They're a nightmare. And I had to go and fence it with bob wire. And I got to finish it. This is my fourth day finishing that bob wire. And these are the reasons why I get slowed down on finishing this challenge is because I'm a, on a ranch that's 10 acres with four big, massive equine by myself in a town where I don't know anyone, where there's no house, there was no water, no power. But it's all coming together. Stay tuned. Peace.